through our questions as as the panel uh, would also still ensure that uh, there's still quality uh, in that engagement even though we are looking at management of time so feel uh, free relax uh, it's an engagement uh, so you're just interacting uh, with the with the panel here so having said that uh, I will just quickly run through. Uh, we have Honorable Kubeka. Honorable Kubeka. Uh, we also have Honorable Faku. We have also Honorable uh, McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. We have uh, Honorable Kumbu. Honorable Kumbu, can you can you can you hear us? Can you chair? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. Sure, um, that's Honorable Kumbu. Um, then we have also Honorable Majosi. Honorable Majosi, are you? Yes, sir, President, I'm here. Yeah. All right. So, Honorable Majosi, we were expecting Honorable Pambo, uh, who has not yet joined. However, with the numbers we have, we should be able to proceed. Um, there's no problem. Uh, then, in that score, um, Honorable Maneli, who's chairing the session uh, at this point in time. Uh, that's the brief introduction of members uh, that will be engaging with you uh, this afternoon. I will now afford you an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. As I said, once again, you are welcomed. Uh, relax, engage with the committee. Thank uh, you very much, Chair. Yes, yes. Thanks, Ms. Clark. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the time afforded by the honorable members and subcommittee. My name is Marina Clark. I currently am employed as the National Director of Epilepsy South Africa. I am also the current chairperson of the South African Disability Alliance and have been a disability activist practically my entire life. So when I looked at this board and its functioning, I basically went back to the mandate of the MDDA. And the mandate of the MDDA can be taken into three key areas. And the first area of that is to enable media development and diversity appropriate and accessible to all South Africans. Secondly, to redress historic exclusions and marginalization. And thirdly, to support the community and small commercial media projects. The key target audience is historically disadvantaged communities, historically diminished language and culture groups, and inadequately served communities. And I think that is a good starting point because people with disabilities fall into all of those categories. If you look at the census on 2011, which is the latest figures available, 7% of people in South Africa are people with disabilities. That equates to about 2.8 million people. Now, it might only sound like 7.4%, but 2.8 million people is a significant grouping within the population. So why is disability issues so important? And there's three key areas. As I said, people with disabilities fall into the target audience of the MDDA. Firstly, being it's a historically disadvantaged group. And then very importantly, it's an inadequately served community. So it falls within the target audience of the MDDA. Also, the right to equal access to information is contained not only in the South African Bill of Rights in Chapter 2 of the Constitution, but it is also in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, on which the White Paper on the Rights of People with Disabilities in South Africa is based. It is basically part of the localization of the CRPD in South Africa. And then I went back to the MDDA Act itself. And in Article 3B4, it very clearly states that one of the objectives of the MDDA is to raise public awareness with regard to media development and diversity issues. And again, disability falls into that 
100%. So if we look at the needs, and I tried to highlight just a few of the needs of persons with disabilities in terms of media. Firstly, South African sign language has been established as a general media principle. And in most media briefings, a lot of programming on television, South African sign language is evident, which is fantastic for deaf people. However, people with a hearing loss who do not make use of South African sign language are excluded because subtitling is still considered a nice to have rather than a have to have. That means, especially now during COVID-19, a lot of people with hearing loss would have been excluded from the information because they cannot hear and they cannot understand South African sign language. Also, people with epilepsy and specifically photosensitive epilepsy can have seizures triggered by flashing images. And very often those flashing images appear without any warning. It's a very simple thing to place a warning on a program that says, there are flashing images in this program, please be aware of it, because that enables a person with epilepsy to make the choice whether they want to watch it or not. Blind and partially sighted people need audio descriptions. Some films have audio description already, but on the whole, audio descriptions are not available. And this flies in the face of things like the Marrakesh Treaty and the changes to the copyright legislation that's currently under consideration. And then the most important to us is the fact that people with disabilities are often negatively and welfarely portrayed in the media. It's very often seen as a charity case, as somebody that should be pitied rather than a rights-based issue. And then, of course, the disability sector and people with disabilities already have the information available to expand disability information in the media. That means that we are able to provide content that can change these perceptions. And I want to end the presentation with a quote by Steve Krug. And he said, the one argument for accessibility that doesn't get made nearly often enough is how extraordinarily better it makes some people's lives. How many opportunities do we have to dramatically improve people's lives just by doing our job a little better? I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirk, um, for the presentation and your brief introduction. Uh, I can guarantee you that members uh, do have uh, your CV. They've had access to that. Um, and therefore, they would uh, also rely on that, including your presentation. We really appreciate your, 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 your presentation at this point. Without um, a waste of time, honorable members, I will uh, follow almost the same uh, order, starting now with honorable Kumbu, uh, if he's got uh, any question to, to ask. And uh, honorable uh, Kumbu, I'm sure you can hear, will be followed by honorable McKenzie. We have honorable Faku, honorable Majosi, and then it will be Honorable Kubega in that order. Honorable Kumbu, do you have any question that you want to ask at this point? Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good day, uh, Ms. Marino Clark. Can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, Honorable yes. Kumbu. Yes. Yeah, I was a good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, how are you today? I am extremely well, despite the cold weather in Cape Town where I live. Oh, okay. okay. So anybody to the oh. north of us, get your warm woolies out. The weather is coming your way. Okay. Excellent. Uh, yes, now. <laughs> uh, in terms of presentation, uh, Ms. Ma Ms. Clark, you are telling us that you, you are you are the chair of uh, the disability one disability organization uh, i just want to understand how will you are because obviously you are an experienced person in that uh, in that area uh, i just want to understand how your experience of working with disability people will contribute uh, in changing the mdda 
and uh, why? If you can just respond to that question. Certainly, thank you for the question, Honorable Gumbo. Let me first clarify that the South African Disability Alliance is not an organization. It is an alliance of 22 national disability organizations that meet. It's not a juristic person in own right, but it is a forum where disability organizations get together to discuss issues of mutual concern and interest. So that's the first thing that I need to clarify. Secondly, as I've highlighted in my presentation, persons with disabilities are often underrepresented, and we find this true in Parliament as well. If we equate with the fact that 7.5% of South Africans are people with disabilities, then people with disabilities must equally be represented in structures at that level. How can I contribute to it? I've been in the disability sector formally since 1990. I spent 15 years with the South African National Council for the Blind before I moved to Epilepsy South Africa in 2005. I have gained wide experience both nationally and internationally in terms of disability rights and was in fact part of the delegation that went to the United Nations a few years ago when the South African report on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities were considered. So I believe that I have gained a lot of experience in terms of disability rights. I am a disability activist and I believe very passionately in the rights of people with disability in terms of accessibility and being able to be part of the community in which they function. So my contribution would be from a disability angle and improving awareness and knowledge about people with disabilities, their needs and their abilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Honorable Kumbu, uh, uh, Honorable McKenzie. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mrs. Clark. Thanks. Thanks very much for for coming through. Um, on certainly on on such a cold day. Um, Mrs. Clark, in, in terms, Mrs. Clark, in terms of the the MDDA mandate, let's assume that uh, um, as you know, the country and the world, in fact, is is in very very challenging and tight economic times. Um, Let's assume there was no budget available at all for the MDDA, um, except to pay directors fees. What would you do in the organization, given that paradigm, to meet the uh, MDDA's mandate of creating uh, um, voices in, in the community? So in other words, what would you do with no money, with no budget, to meet that objective? Um, and then as a second question, um, can, you, um, can you name one or two state-owned entities or state-owned companies that you could envisage the MDDA linking up with um, synergistically? And, and how could you leverage that partnership, if you like, strategic partnership, to again meet the uh, um, outcomes of the MDDA mandate? Um, thank you, Mr. Clark. I'm sorry, it, it, it is a fairly difficult question, but you are first in the day and the mind's still very <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you yeah, very thank you, much, Honourable, Honourable McKenzie. Um, you know, there's some advantages to being first, but there's also some advantages to being last. Um, the advantage to being first is that everybody is fresh and everybody is still thinking very quickly. Um, I'm glad you asked the question about what would you do without a budget. Um, having spent most of my career in the nonprofit sector, I am certainly used to doing things without a budget. Um, I'm always surprised when I look at the budgets that the corporate sector has available for simple things like arranging flowers for a venue, uh, for, a, for an event, I'm sorry, um, when we try and put an event together with no money whatsoever. So I'm quite used to that kind of scenario. I think what's important to understand is that the right of access to information of persons with disabilities is not a nice to have. It is an imperative. It is a basic human right. By denying somebody access to information because they are blind or because they are deaf, it's right up there with a the constitutional anomaly because the right to access and prevention of discrimination on the basis of disability is contained in the Bill of Rights, Chapter 2 of our Constitution. So that's the first thing. 
South Africa was one of the first countries to ratify the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities together with the optional protocol. So again, our government has made it very clear that the rights of persons with disabilities is a matter of importance and a serious issue to them, otherwise they would not have ratified it. And the same goes for several other international instruments. So when it comes to things like, for example, the SABC, you asked for some examples of statutory bodies or government agencies. The SABC as a national broadcaster has a duty it's a duty bearer in terms of making information accessible. So there isn't really a question of if you have money available. Many things can be done at a very cost efficient ratio. For example, to add a screen to a program that says this concerns people with epilepsy because it has flashing images, it's really not an expensive thing to do. To have subtitling is not an expensive thing to do it can be done quite easily. So many of the issues that we've raised can be done at a very low cost, but would make a huge difference in the lives of people. I also think that the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Communication, who has the oversight role, and the Department of Communication obviously have a major role to play, and that already has a budgetary allocation. It's very seldom that there's a situation or a scenario when there's absolutely no money involved. There's always a little money to be found. And I think also that if we leverage the money that is available, we'll be able to do a lot more with it. So in short, um, I don't think money is a major stumbling block. It's always nice to have lots of it. But uh, the NPO sector and the disability sector has survived for basically as long as this country has survived without much money. You know, there's still a lot of nonprofit organizations in our sector that receive no funding from government that generate their own funding. So I don't see money as a major stumbling block. And then, as I say, the, the duty bearers have a duty to bear and they need to allocate resources to make this a reality. I trust that answers your question, Honorable McKenzie. Thank you, Honorable McKenzie. I will now take Honorable Fak. Thank you, Honorable Mr. President. Hi, Ms. Fak. How are you? I am very well, thank you, Honorable Hi, Fak. Okay, thank you for coming through. Um, I'm looking at your CV and I'm very much impressed with the skills that you have developed through the past years, especially that I see that you've been through the ILO Master of Trainers, um, training of masters. I, I see that, I see that you've been through the um, start SYB project. I know this is a very good program. I just want to ask you with regard to the current funding model that MPDA is offering. If given a, an opportunity to be a board member, what can be done differently to the current model that MPDA is using? My second question would be, is um, what could be the role of MPDA in promoting community media in the digital, digital environment? And I know that you, I see that you have a degree in trauma. I just want to check on the cultural aspect. You know, sometimes our kids go to these model C schools. So I believe that community radios must play a role in terms of promoting the different cultures in South Africa. So I would want to hear your views with, with regards to that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Faku, for those questions. Uh, yes, I'm indeed a master trainer with the ILO in several of their entrepreneurial programs. I'm very pleased to be able to share with you that uh, through initiatives we've started in South Africa, the ILO will now be offering some of their entrepreneurial training through an e-learning platform, which will make it far more accessible and more cost effective. And that's being launched on the 5th of June. In fact, this very morning, I spent time with a trainer and two entrepreneurs who are both blind, well, and the trainer is blind as well, in developing these kind of initiatives. When you talk about the funding model um, and the, the community media, I think it is a critical element. You know, when you talk to community media, particularly community radio, it is often 
the single most important source of information for people. It's often talking to people who do not have the educational opportunities that other South Africans might have had or might have at the moment. So community radio lends itself to being an educational tool. We believe, well, one of the things that we would like to see from the disability sector is that there is more attention given to disability issues. And I'm not talking about issues like social grants. I'm talking about exposing entrepreneurs with disabilities. There's some amazing work being done at community level that people are simply not aware of because they don't have the platform. They don't have a budget to engage radio or television advertising, which is often too expensive for them. But if they could have a program on a regular basis, and some community radio stations already do this, where people can actually interact, talk about their work, what their business is about, because that's the market they need to be talking to, the very community in which they operate, rather than having a national advertisement. So I think community media are very important. People are moving away more and more from print media, but radio seems to be taking on a far more important role, particularly in rural areas, where there is often a lack of information, and then particularly so for persons with disabilities, and particularly for women and girls with disabilities, because they are often right at the back of the queue, marginalized by their geographic location, by their gender, and by the fact that they have a disability. So it's a triple threat for those people. I think community media can go a long way to actually making that happen. We know that there's also the importance of um, hearing community information in your own language, mother tongue, very important. For example, um, to the best of my knowledge, there's only one radio station based in the Northern Cape that broadcasts in Khoi. And that means there's one radio station at a local level, somebody who lives in another area, for example, in the Eastern Cape, where there's a big Khoi community would not be able to access that information unless they're able to live stream. And again, data is expensive in South Africa. So those are the kind of changes that could be made where people could have a platform in their own language to actually move their community forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we now go to Honorable Majosa. Honorable Machose. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, good afternoon to honorable members and uh, good afternoon to you too, uh, Ms. Clark. Am thank I you. It correctly? You are indeed. Thank you so much, Honorable Machose. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I heard you spoke uh, passionately about the diversity of language and uh, also the exclusion maybe of uh, disabled people and so forth. I want to, I want to check with you, um, do you think we should promote more of um, in the community media of dis disability and languages, or should we also promote the traditions and culture of our own diverse way and religions that uh, we believe in differently as South Africans? And uh, uh, maybe just to add on that also to say, with what I've said, do, do, you, do you see a future, do you see an MTTA board or an MTTA as an entity, as an agency, uh, having a future in the next coming generation to promoting the community media? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Majorzi. Those are some difficult and some big questions to answer. Um, let me start off by the question around disability and language and how that should be promoted. Um, when you talk, for example, about deaf people, and we distinguish between the word deaf with a capital D and the word deaf with a small letter D. Deaf with a capital D is viewed not so much as a disability grouping, but more as a cultural grouping because it's a group of people with their own language and their own culture. So they view themselves as a cultural group. And I think that's important to understand. When it comes to language, there's already South African sign language, but there's also things like Braille, for example, 
that is the language of blind people, the language in which they read and write. So those two things are critically important. When disability is portrayed in the media, and particularly at community level, it can change perceptions around disability very significantly. Because in a lot of communities, the belief still exists that people with disabilities should be excluded, should not be part of a community. For example, a person with, an ep with epilepsy is often seen as somebody who is bewitched or somebody that has been cursed. And this is a very common perception. We can share that information and change things. You know, I work with people who are who have epilepsy, who are environmentalists, um, who are mountaineers, who are marathon runners, who are advocates and lawyers. Um, you know, we know that one in a hundred people in South Africa will have epilepsy. So if you look around you, you might find that there's people in this very subcommittee that might have epilepsy and you're simply not aware of it. So when you provide knowledge, particularly at community level, it changes people's perceptions. When you can have somebody who has a disability, who can speak out and be seen not as a burden on their community, but as somebody that can contribute to the community, the views of the community can change. Yes, there are cultural beliefs, but some cultural beliefs, I believe, should be changed, and particularly in terms of disability. You know, across Africa, we are still hearing stories about people with albinism, babies with albinism, that are killed. Adults with albinism who are murdered and their body parts sold in the belief that it's magic. I know a lot of people with albinism, and I promise you, they, they might be nice people, but there's nothing magical about them. The same way that people believe that somebody with epilepsy can predict the future. You know, I'm the national director of Epilepsy South Africa. If people with epilepsy could predict the future, I would be winning the lottery every week. No <laughs> doubt about that. But it's just never happened. So, you know, it's those kind of perceptions. Um, if you think, for example, of a young mother who might have a limited education, has a small baby that is diagnosed with epilepsy, where does she get the opportunity of learning how to deal with her child? Does she know what to do if that child has a seizure? Community radio can provide that information. In fact, we ran a program for many years um, with the radio station in the Northern Cape that provided exactly that. We had a weekly talk on epilepsy and other disability issues. And people could call in and ask questions and so forth. So it really was very val valuable. And I would think that in that way, community radio can change people's perceptions, but still respect cultural values. Okay. Thank you. Thank Jay, you. Uh, one, uh, thank two. you. I just wanted to 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 let we were clear on this one that on the other ones of albinos and what that is not is not a cultural thing but it's a it's a perception that people have that if maybe they take your ear or they do what they'll get millions or they'll it's not it's not cultural that thing is just a mere perception and evil spirits that are, are happening. I, I hear what you say, and if I may respond to that, while we say it's not a cultural issue, the culture of a community is made up by the beliefs within a community. For example, um, there's something like a Christian culture or an Islam culture, and that's based on the things people believe to be true. Whether they are true or not is beside the point. It's what people believe to be true. Okay, thanks, uh, Honorable Machozi. I will now take Honorable Kubega. Honorable Kubega. Thank you, Chair. Uh, afternoon, everybody, to my colleagues, and also afternoon to Ms. Clark. Uh, welcome to this interview. I can see uh, you come uh, being well prepared. Uh, you are talking with passion and when you respond to the questions, but I'm just having only two questions to you, um, Ms. Clark. Uh, as we find ourselves in the current socio-economic situation due to COVID-19, 
what do you think uh, can MDDA do different in future with regard to assisting especially community radio to keep its audience a, a metla? Uh, the, the second question is that uh, in, in 2019, uh, ICASA had to close a number of community uh, radio stations due to severe non-compliance with the rules. Centec also complains uh, about non-payment of <coughs> signal distribution fees by some stations. What do you think the MDDA also can do to improve uh, that situation? Uh, thank you, Metlak. Thank you so much, Honorable Kubeka. Yes, um, again, a number of questions you're asking, and I think COVID-19 has been a great opportunity for our country to see where the shortfalls are and how we can change things. And I think it's general knowledge that after COVID-19, it will never be business as usual again. Things have changed and they will remain changed. So... One of the things that, that is of concern is during the COVID-19 crisis, there was insufficient information and still remains insufficient information made available to people with disabilities. And I've already in my presentation highlighted some of the communication issues, particularly subtitling of major events like a speech by our president or one of the cabinet ministers where some people simply couldn't follow it no matter how hard they tried. You're asking about how do you keep an audience? And it's a very simple situation. When people join something, be it listening to a radio station or be it joining a political party or a sports club or a church, they join because they are getting something from it. And yes, in some cases it might be tangible, they might get money or a job out of it, but in most cases, it's because it satisfies a need that the person has, a need to be of service to other people, or a need to contribute in some way, or a need to belong to a specific grouping. So to keep an audience means that you need to be providing something that that audience would like to have. Then it's very easy to keep them. It's when people feel that their needs are no longer met that they move away from an organization or a structure or simply turn the dial to another radio station. So people will find a home where they get something from. I'm quite aware of some of the closures of radio stations. Um, I think very much as is the case in the nonprofit sector, radio stations fall in that category. It's one thing to have a passion for a specific issue and to start a nonprofit or to start broadcasting because you feel passionate about it. But that's not enough. A radio station is a business and enterprise like any other. And that means that people not only need to have a passion for what they're doing and the technical skills to be able to operate a radio station, but they must also have the business management skills to be able to manage that business. So when it comes to things like managing finances, Somebody might be a great broadcaster. They might be very passionate about their community and rendering a service to that community. But if they are unable to manage the business, manage the finances, the people, the resources in the business, it will not last very long because passion, unfortunately, does not pay the rent. So I think one of the things that, that the MDDA could consider is together with its grant-making facility to also make business training available to people starting out community stations or operating existing radio stations. And this could be spread across virtually anybody in that radio station. You know, with a small community radio station, uh, the station manager is very often also the main broadcaster and very often the accountant as well, and then does marketing as a sideline. So your resources are very limited, and it's very much the same as when you start a peer support group in a community for people with disabilities. So I would draw on that knowledge and information to start a project where people can access business management training so that they are actually able to manage the business successfully and not only work on passion and the desire to do something. So in short, 
Um, keeping the audience is a case of offering people what they need. And secondly, to maintain a radio station would require business management in addition to technical knowledge and a passion for what you are doing. Thank you, Honorable uh, Kubeka. I think on my on my side, uh, Ms. Clark, it's just to go back to this point that you've just raised at the end. I think very a very important point: uh, the passion versus uh, the ability to sustain uh, the radio station. <clears throat> but uh, throughout the the interaction we've had with you, you've emphasized access, access access as a right uh, how and i'm saying this uh, that you look at it outside of what the norms of uh, the mdda are in looking at applications what will be your own uh, perspective uh, in trying to balance that access that you've been talking to as 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 a right uh, enshrined in the constitution versus be the sustainability um, of those uh, community media uh, platforms, um, especially now there's also the digital side that has also come in, uh, which impacts on your traditional uh, media platforms in terms of uh, community uh, media. So, so that sustainability versus the access, how do you strike that balance um, uh, so that uh, the, the community media can still thrive going into the future, even with the uh, digital uh, that has come into the space. That's that's the point I would want you to just elevate uh, uh, for the for the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Manelli. Um, firstly, the the issue of passion versus ability, to me, are not excluding things. They they are the same thing but the one must be sustained through knowledge. You know, in any operation, there is what's referred to as the KSA, the knowledge, the skills, the ability. And without training, no matter how passionate people are, they simply do not have sufficient information. In my experience, I've been a trainer since 1997, and in my experience, I found that when you allow people to absorb some information, some knowledge, and then allow them to practice that so that it becomes a habit. They say it takes 28 days to make or break a habit, as many smokers have found out in recent months. Um, but <laughs> I can see there's some smokers around when I look at the smiles on faces. Um, you, you are <laughs> this far. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when somebody practices something, it becomes a habit. It becomes something they do almost automatically. Um, and that is explained in things like the, the five levels of learning and so forth. So passion will sustain, but it's a short-term thing, whereas ability, knowledge, skills, ability is something that is taught and that must be maintained over a period. And that's why I refer to both startups as well as existing media companies, because just because you've been around for a year or two years or five years does not mean that you are effectively managing the business. So that in terms of passion versus ability. When you talk about sustainability versus access, again, I don't see the two as being exclusive of each other. Accessibility, and you're quite right, I'm very passionate about it because it is a, one of the most basic rights of people with disabilities, in fact, of all South Africans. So to me, accessibility does not have to be an expensive thing. It does not have to be something that is going to place a risk to the sustainability of a, a local media or a community media outlet, but rather something that will enhance it. You know, earlier we had a question asked um, by Honorable Quebeca about how do you retain an audience? And you retain an audience by offering something that they want. And if your community radio station offers accessibility, or if the, the provincial television station offers accessibility through subtitling, they will attract an audience because people will flock to where they are able to get information in the most accessible format for themselves. How would you marry those two very easily? by actually asking people with disabilities what it is that they need, what it is that they want. 
And there's a big difference between need and want. You know, in our sector, the disability sector, there's an old saying that says nothing about us without us. So when it comes to sustainability versus accessibility, the two would marry very easily. But I do think that the MDDA would require the help, the input from people with disabilities themselves. And the disability sector is organized sufficiently that that can be accessed at a low cost. Uh, thanks, uh, 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 let's just make sure that I remember that uh, those who are joining uh, and our guests, just, just make sure that your mic is muted uh, so that the background doesn't uh, disrupt the meeting. Um, once again, as I said, thanks. Uh, you've uh, responded to questions asked by honorable members. Uh, I will now afford you a one minute opportunity to make your departing point to the committee and we can uh, then uh, close this uh, interview. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, firstly, I would like to thank you for the opportunity that I was afforded to actually speak to you. And regardless of whether my nomination is successful or not, I trust I've said something about disability that will make all of you think a little differently about people with disabilities. And if that's the case, then I feel I've achieved quite a lot already because you are in a position to influence the way other people think. I'd also like to ask the, uh, to, to thank the members of the subcommittee who have asked some very thought provoking and very difficult questions. Thank you for the preparation that went into it to, to ask the good questions. And then again, I'd like to remind you that the right of access to information is not a nice gift to give to a person with a disability, it's a right. So thank you very much. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No. Uh, thanks, uh, Clark. As I said, we have come to uh, the end of the interview, and I can tell you that uh, what I said in the beginning would have been achieved in the interaction. And uh, a number of us as uh, honorable members, we now also know how to champion better uh, what the people with disabilities are faced with out there. And, and I think together we can be able to change the perceptions in society. Uh, Chair, may I, may I just add right at the end, thank you for the, the friendliness and hospitality with which I was greeted. You've made it a really interesting interaction. Yes. And then I'd also like to thank, thank uh, Tim and Corsi and his team for the arrangements made, because often it's difficult to get these things done. Um, he will tell you that I was very surprised to get a phone call from him on Sunday. I thought I was the only person working, but in fact, he was working as well. So please thank the staff as well for their arrangements. Uh, they are listening and, and they oh. hear that it's on the bottom of that, that you are thanking them for doing their job uh, in that scope. But as I it's, said... Uh, it's the way in which a job is done, not that the job is done. Yes. So, so I, I think... Um, as I said, we uh, we have come to the closure, and and we really thank you for for making time, um, and that uh, from here the administration, uh, Tim Binkos and the team, will be the ones who do further interaction. Uh, as far as the subcommittee is concerned, we'll uh, be continuing with the with the interviews uh, uh, and hear other other candidates. Once again, thank you. Thank um, you very much you. and have a pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. So, Tembi, you'll uh, uh, prepare us for the exit and uh, introduction of the other. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, members. Uh, as Mr. Marina Clark is exiting, we have just been joined by Mr. Edwin Naidu who is our second candidate for the day. And Mr. Naidu is aware of how this how committee, committee is proceeding and he has, and he has, uh, he has joined. Yeah, yeah. So just sort out uh, the sound, it's okay. speaking back to us. Was it from you, Chair? Yeah, as you were speaking, it, your, your voice was like doubling up. I'm not sure if other members were experiencing the same. Honorable McKenzie, I see your hand is up. Yes. Honourable uh, McKenzie, is up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Just on a technical issue, for example, when I'm looking at my screen now, 
Um, all I can see is two pictures of you in like different pictures. Now I can see Tim and Corsi, but still, so there's no camera movement. I can't see any of the other members. I could see um, uh, Ms. Clark in a still picture coming and going and coming and going. Like, yeah, I can see you now, Chairperson, but still yeah. in a still picture, no movement. But the voices are fine, but the, the cameras aren't working. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, maybe just before you unmute uh, the candidate, uh, can you just uh, check on that, uh, Tembi? Yeah, would, uh, I can give you a, a minute. We'll start at 15.55. So I'm just okay. also calling a member to check uh, if there may be other things on, on his side. All right. uh, but I do know I do know that Honorable McKenzie, uh, most members keep the rule that if they are not on the platform, uh, they would usually uh, switch uh, their cameras uh, uh, off and and then put them on as as they speak uh, to also uh, allow us to have a better connection. Uh, but as I say, mm -hmm. Tim, because you can do that, we'll start at 15:55. Then you can let yeah. in the candidates. Okay. Honorable okay. McKenzie, I, I can hear you are talking, but I'm losing gears. Huh. Sorry, Chairperson, with your I'm indulgence. Saying, I can't hear you properly. Uh, you, are, you, are, you are raising something. Can Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, clear. Okay. Yeah, so uh, for example, I mean, the same situation exists. I can, you know, unless it's a bad connection in the West. Or is it a bad connection on my side? Um, you know, if it's my side, maybe I can I can do something about it. Okay. Just just a quick question on other members. Um, are they experiencing the same issue? Are they or uh, are are they are they fine on their side? So that we can see whether it's it's a connection, um, it's a connection issue, or it's just um, the platform issue. Okay. No, we are fine, Jefferson. I, I, I don't. I'm not experiencing any problems. Honorable Kumbu, I, I can see you want to. No. Speak. No, I'm not experiencing any problem, Chair. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, Found this so. Chair. Yes, uh, Honorable Fakum. Chair. Uh, oh, oh, I thought it's you because uh, I see you are also trying to speak. Honorable Kubega. Yes, on my side, it was that thing of doubling voices, actually. Okay, so it's uh, yeah. you can you can hear Honorable yeah. McKenzie, yeah. not the power. Yeah. <laughs> so the Eastern Cape is okay. Okay. Um, you see, Chair, like, like there, instead of seeing the speaker, I saw Honorable Majosi sort of frozen. Now you're back laughing a little bit, but kind of half frozen. I've just <laughs> checked my speed, Chairperson. <laughs> I have 120 megabits per second up uh, uh, download and uh, 19 megabits per second upload. So it's, I've got a very good speed here. <laughs> yes. And and it nice. seems uh, probably probably those who are slow are now hitting on your speed. But that's not what I'm saying. Uh, Tim Bingosi and the team, can you sort us out so that we can then let the candidate in? Uh Chief, if it wasn't lockdown, I would invite you to come and live with me and share my my internet. <laughs> Chair, I think I think uh, ICT is here, uh, Mr. Kasama. But like uh, he he was doing the check, Chair, in that uh, uh, all of us except for Mr. McKenzie seem uh, not to have uh, a, a connection problem. So, but uh, maybe <laughs> ICT, uh, uh, if you can nope. try maybe uh, and give Mr. McKenzie a call of camera and then see if you can assist him. OK, all right. OK, uh, if we that's the case, break. shoot. Pardon? Oh, now I'm, I'm gone again. <laughs> no? Chair yes? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Chair? I hear you. Yes, I can. OK. It seems that Gauteng is under siege today. I was saying, let us give Honorable McKenzie chair two minutes and, and then we can reconvene him. Um, okay, why is so, ICT upset the matter? Yes. 
the the only okay. way I could I could assist is is to just request um, Honorable Mackenzie to to just hang up and then rejoin the meeting, and then we see how the connection is working because it seems like it's on his side this issue that we are having. Other members are, are still fine. I'm also not experiencing any issues from my end. Okay, um, as as Honorable Faku would have suggested, we allow this in the two minutes we have. And, and and then reconnect. I'm sure it also allows a bit of stretch uh, uh, for, for for members who are sure. Sure. not on, on the platform. Yes. As a, as a members uh, are, are stretching for the uh, two minutes of Mr. McKenzie, and uh, just safe to say that the candidate has already joined. So uh, okay. in your discussion, just be mindful of that. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay. No, as I say, we'll 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 start exactly for. At least the West looks okay. <laughs> And I don't have the high speed on this side. I'm still struggling with broadband. 160 megabits per second. <laughs> You're operating on 12. As long as the world is safe, we are safe. The Eastern Cape is well represented. The, the Eastern Cape is well represented in East London and in Cape Town, Honorable Fab. And in Gauteng. And in Gauteng. And everywhere. As long as the world is covered, we are covered. So, no, I just hope that we'll be finished before that crunch time when the winds are starting. <laughs> and then the West will be in the serious <laughs> I'm ready to take over as a chair at nine o'clock when that those strong winds those, in Johannesburg. <laughs> I'll make sure that uh, by that time we're done. <laughs> There's no space for any cool today. <laughs> so, Tim, Tim does not live in Gauteng. He, he lives outside of Gauteng. When we go to the West End, everybody envies to go to Gauteng. They can't just speak at me Johannesburg. He does not live in Gauteng. He lives outside of Gauteng. And you call him uh, a uh, Timos. No, we have a bit of northwest uh, Gauteng. Um, you know, it's the old Transvaal, if you want to put it in that way. So, uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, Mr. Ngoma, may you please just check on Mr. Um, Honorable McKenzie, please, and see if he's having any issues, uh, because I don't see him dialing in any, anymore. So just see if he's having any issues. Um, I don't have his number. That's why I can't give him a call. I'm on it. I'm okay, on it sure. The network is better in Lusiki Siki today. <laughs> we, are yet, we are yet to I'm see if it can sustain. <laughs> we are yet to see if it will sustain. <laughs> you know? I see we in KZN, so, there's no problem. And how can Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Everybody. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry. Before the West disappoints you, let's uh, just make sure that uh, we have uh, the connection of the candidate. <laughs> the candidate. Uh, uh, that's uh, Mr. Edwin? Mr. Naidu? Mr. Naidu? Yes, Mr. Edwin Naidu. Just uh, taking my note properly, yeah? That's Mr. Naidu. Okay. Is he connected? Yes, Chair. Hi, Edwin. Good afternoon, Honorable oh, members. Yes. Okay, that's good. Uh, he's connected. Let me, Honorable members, let's uh, just uh, reconvene again. Um, we must start by apologizing for keeping you uh, waiting a bit. We're just making sure that uh, there can be a flow 
in the interview and and that all members are able to participate. Uh, we hope uh, you, you understand that. Uh, we also want to thank you uh, for making yourself uh, available to interact with the committee. Uh, <clears throat> this is the subcommittee of uh, the Portfolio Committee on Communications in the National Assembly. As provided in our rules, a portfolio committee can put up a subcommittee that focuses on a particular matter. And therefore, the focus of this subcommittee is the appointment process for the MDTA board members, of which tonight uh, you've been nominated for hence your appearance before this uh, subcommittee. And this subcommittee therefore reports to the main committee. As we will be proceeding, uh, maybe just clarify quickly uh, that we will uh, afford you an opportunity to introduce yourself briefly and uh, you will infuse your presentation as part of that uh, introduction. Uh, this would happen uh, immediately after I have briefly introduced the members that will be interacting with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, and these members after your presentation will then have an opportunity to interact with you, uh, each member looking at five minutes maximum. And that five minutes uh, takes into account the questions asked as well as your responses in the five minutes. Um, if, if, if we have an understanding on that, I will not uh, waste any more time, but just to quickly introduce the members. Uh, we have uh, Honorable Kubeka. Um, Honorable Kubeka, you are, you are still connected? Honorable Kubeka. That's Honorable Kubeka. Yes, Honorable uh, Mackenzie. Um, you can see him on top there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, then Honorable Faku. That's uh, Honorable Faku. Uh, then we have uh, Honorable Gumbu. Uh, we also have Honorable Majosi. Honorable Majosi. Um, we needed to have Honorable Pambo, who is not with us, but uh, we are able to proceed given the numbers. Um, uh, Honorable Manelli, as you can see, chairing uh, the session. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the members that uh, will be interacting with you this afternoon. I now welcome you uh, uh, once again and allow you now space to briefly introduce yourself and infuse the presentation. I can assure you now that members also had an opportunity of looking at your detailed CV uh, as submitted to, to the members. Uh, but that's now an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. Over to you, Mr. Naidu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members, uh, for this opportunity to chat with you. And basically, a, a brief background of mine. I'm an experienced media and communications person. You know, I've worked for a number of print publications. Yeah. Uh, Just so that you switch your, uh, your camera oh, on, I'm you. struggling to see you. Um, we, we can hear you. But, oh, uh, OK. That's for purposes of uh, those that are following. Uh, Am I there? That, oh, uh, that's, that's OK. Helpful. Yes. OK, is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Well, basically. Yes, Am, am I clear? Are you yes. able to see? Yeah, it, it, it's going to get better as we as we move, I think. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Well, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, it's, uh, I'm privileged to be able to chat with you about a position on the MDDA board. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an experienced media and communications uh, professional. I've worked for a number of newspapers, you know, the Star, the Sunday Independent, Tribune, ETV, I've done work on Capricorn FM and Radio 786. I've also had the opportunity to do PR for National Geographic and uh, also, you know, work in business banking with NetBank. I've done also extensive media training, training something like 300 uh, members of, of, of the banking group. I've also had a stint with the Film and Publications Board as an examiner 
and I'm currently a commissioner on a part-time basis with the BCCSA. So, you know, I've had a very varied ca career in journalism spanning something like maybe 30 years. Uh, I've also contributed to two books on Nelson Mandela and was a correspondent for Bloomberg BNA and I still write on education. I still do work on gender and uh, I've also been to Oxford and US on scholarships. And uh, in my presentation, I've included links to a number of recent stories that I'm very proud of that I've done on gender in media in Africa, which, uh, you know, has inspired me to continue taking the subject further. So, you know, in terms of my presentation, <coughs> I do understand that, you know, and subscribe to the view that a free and uh, independent and diverse media is a key pillar of democracy in assessing the role. I believe that, you know, we should look at where we've come from. And, you know, prior to democracy, media was used as a government mouthpiece, a propaganda tool. You know, we can't forget that the National Party established clandestine operations and, you know, established the citizen newspaper. But there were some media, uh, you know, ed editors at the forefront of change that were fearless. You know, the Rand Daily Mail, latest Wilaki Susulu at New Nation, Max Dupria at Freya Vigblad, you know, Anton Harbert and Erwin Manoim at Mail and Guardian, Muxin Williams at the South, etc. But, you know, post-democratic South Africa requires us not to go down that road, although we've seen examples of attempts to do so. But, you know, when we're talking about diversity in terms of content, we need different levels of leadership. You know, there's no one size fits all. We need training and content that uh, considers... Okay. Honorable Kubeka, sorry, Miss um, Naidu. No now he's lost on my side with the, 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 the voice. I can't hear anything at the moment. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Um, we'll ask ICT to help okay. in, the, in, the, in the background. Uh, can you hear now, Honorable uh, Kubeka, as I speak? Yes, I can hear now, but on okay. his side, it seems as if there's a technical problem, I don't know. Okay, let's hear when he continues, if you are able to hear now. Okay, so, uh, yes, uh, I, I was talking about, you know, post-democratic South Africa requires us not to go down that route, but, uh, you know, to ensure that there is diversity in content, we need different levels of leadership for that, and there's no one size fits all, you know. You need training and content that considers context of urban and rural audiences. And I, I think, you know, we, we when you talk about MDDA, the key thing that comes to mind is ownership. It has been in white hands, foreign owned as well. We've seen that changing slowly, but we've also got to guard against fronting. I think, you know, there must be true ownership of media and employment definitely must reflect the demographics. I think the MDDA can guide and steer the, the national conver conversation in this regard, and it has a crucial role to play. In, in line with the constitutional imperative to provide for freedom of expression and access to information, the role of, MD, of the MDDA is aligned to the NDP vision, and that's you know helping to create efficient, competitive, and responsive economic infrastructure by assisting community media to harness the power of that evol evolving landscape. I think, you know, you've seen that uh, with, with the number of changes in recent uh, weeks where you've had media houses like uh, Associated Publishing, you've seen Caxton closing down its print division. So there definitely is, you know, a, a dire need for media in communities to be established, to, to take up the, the cudgels to ensure that we are giving voice to the voiceless. And I think you find that uh, the, the, the key challenge, well, is developing accessible, transformed, diversified media through redress. And uh, well, one of the things is, you know, you're building communities through locally owned news and controlled platforms that focus on, you know, vulnerable groups, women, children, particular focus on child rights and people with disabilities. I think, you know, over the last, when I mentioned earlier, the last few weeks I've been doing stories on women in gender in the continent. 
those we've also done South Africa and you know women throughout Africa are marginalized in newsrooms they come out second best they earn worse than men and it, it, it's it's a culture that's got to change and it's also about ensuring that in communities you're able to build and uplift women so that they also become the credible voices that we, we don't see that they are in communities. Yes, there are many shining examples in South Africa of women doing well, but on the continent and in our communities, you see media still being very much a, a male-focused world. And I think, you know, we've got a role to play in bridging the gender gap. And, uh, you know, the, the key thing is, a key role for the MDDA is creating awareness about what it does and showing how people can access it, you know, how you access uh, funding. And when you talk about funding, in terms of the role, I do understand that it's not, there's no open pot of money to be funding media initiatives. You've got to raise that money through partnerships. You've got to work with different players, for example, statutory bodies, uh, from Department of Communications, universities, even schools, and, uh, you know, private sector. <clears throat> so I think, you know, the goals of the MD, MDDA are in line with the mission to develop media, to raise new voices, reflect transformation and diversity in media. And, of course, you know, the great thing is, well, the most important thing is accountability. You know, we've got to be inclusive. There's got to be integrity of the projects and professionalism but above all accountability to ensure that the projects that MDDA supports, you know, derive value for the community and of course play a part in terms of uh, what it does for the media landscape in general. Excuse me. So I think, you know, looking at the current uh, context and outlook, since it was formed in 2003, the MDDA has helped transform the media landscape in South Africa. There's no doubt about that. There's been tremendous progress, particularly in indigenous communities, but there's potential to grow it further. And, uh, you know, for me, it's about uh, creating jobs by doing this, growing local economies, uh, economies and bearing in mind you know, there is a budgetary constraint because there's no open pot of money, as I said. And when the MDDA was formed, it had funding from the four print media groups. That's now stopped putting pressure on MDDA to obviously raise money and to ensure that it's able to fund projects that can make a difference. So, you know, when looking at the role of MDDA and the current context, I see that, you know, last year, it achieved 80% of its targets. It organized a, organized a summit of more than 200 stakeholders and, you know, approved 28 community and small commercial projects. So that's very good and particularly reaching 7 million listeners or 25% of the country. So, you know, you know, definitely the media is changing. There's room with, with the opportunities of 4IR to look at how it can play a part in content generation, how it can play a part in helping broaden the ambit of reaching communities throughout the country. So while I know that there is turbulence in the media, I see the MDDA's role is to explore opportunities to amplify and increase its footprint through partnerships through, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier. And I think, you know, the, the key thing that one can't ignore as part of this role in fulfilling its role, you've got to be mindful that there's been challenges over the last eight years or so in terms of how it manages its finance so that there's a need for a better eye in terms of risk so that you know the organization itself there's no squandering of money so that every money put into a project yields dividends because when, when you squander money you're obviously not reaching the people that you want to, to, to benefit from MDDA so I think you know it's about tightening up risk measures making sure that there's better advocacy outreach on projects that we supported or that are supported and show communities how they can shape these ideas or apply and you know improve on research on media looking into examples and maybe also in ensuring that these examples look beyond our borders to see how is it being done if it's being done in africa as well so in, in concluding honorable members i'd like to say that you know notwithstanding there's been positive changes since the birth of the MDDA 
but, but there are still challenges. And as I see challenges are opportunities and funding is definitely a concern. <laughs> and also, you know, it, it's an opportunity. And if, if you re recall, you know, I while, while doing this presentation, I couldn't help but go back to a speech that was done by President, uh, former President Mandela on the 27th of October 1995, when he spoke about how media can transform. And this was maybe like seven years before the M MDDA was born, where he talked about foreign investment can stimulate a diverse opportunities for black South Africans, but it can also entrench monopoly. We've got to guard against that. He said there was nothing wrong in foreign invest investment, but it depends on how that advances the cause of diversity and empowerment. And I think, you know, there, there's been nuggets of great uh, of great things done. If you look at the MDDA reports and stuff, there, there's great publications throughout the country that one can be proud of, you know, in Zulu, in Koza, in, 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 in people with disabilities producing magazines as well. So I think, you know, in serving communities, expertise must be transferred to ensure, you know, editors on mainstream publications should be working, should be taking their skills to communities to inspire the next generation because nothing is forever in terms of, if you're an editor now, you're not gonna be there forever, but if you impart your skill, that's actually a good thing. I'll, I'll leave you with a quote from President Mandela. Above all, black intellectuals are called upon to take more active part in debates within society. They are called upon to take an interest in journalism, for it does not assist the cause of diversity if black intellectuals are seen to be passive in national discourse. And if journalists are seen to abandon, abandon the profession in large numbers, it does not help the cause if black entrepreneurs do not develop an interest in the media industry. Thank you for giving me this hearing, honorable members. Thank you, Mr. Naidu, uh, for the presentation. Um, indeed, we'll now uh, allow members to interact with uh, your presentation. Uh, as it is the norm, I will start with Honorable Kumbu, followed by Honorable McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, yes, I can hear you, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Naidu yeah. does hear you. Yes. I can hear. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Naidu. Good afternoon, sir. And uh, how are you? No, doing good, thank you. Lockdown oh, has been... <laughs> I was trying to listen to your presentation. I want to find that you were, uh, you were quite prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I'm having, I'm just having two questions for you. Sure. You see, Mr. Naidu, as a person who is coming from uh, the communication uh, background, eh? uh, if you can just explain to me what could be the role of uh, the MDDA in promoting community media in a digital environment? That's the first question. The second question, I just want to get your understanding of uh, the media freedom. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Kumbu. Uh, Mr. Naidu. <clears throat> okay, thank, thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, well, basically, let me start with the second one first, if you don't mind. Media freedom is basically the opportunity for media to express itself, to be able to report freely on issues of public importance, to be able to tell stories, you know, without uh, fear, without uh, being influenced or victimized. Uh, it, it's the freedom to report, report on government, report on business, report on society. I, I think I'm going to give you a short answer because there's also a long intellectual debate, university type answer. But, you know, it, it's the freedom to be able to express yourself in media, in news, and to tell stories without fear or favor. That's the second one. The first question, if I get it correctly, it's how digital can influence or can be used in communities. Is, is, is that, Am I correct? Yeah, I just want to explain to, to me what will be the role of the MDDA in promoting community media in a digital environment. <clears throat> okay, no sure. 
I think, you, you know, the, if you consider newspapers, if you consider the, the whole challenges in print industry right now, there, there's been a heavy drop in circulation. That's because a, a lot of media is actually be, being run via or driven by social media. Now, if you look at uh, anything that you read in tomorrow, today's paper was on social media yesterday. So this creates an opportunity, I think, for the MDDA to actually find platforms that it can take to communities to set up little, you know, media networks don't have to be like your, in the traditional days when I started, when there was a printing press, uh, you know, printing out newspapers and delivering, you see the person selling at the street corner, etc. Uh, I used to deliver papers as a, pa uh, as a boy growing up with my brother. You know, I don't see that happening anymore. It's take de deprived youngsters of revenue for one, but we have to find ways in which you, you, you know, get society to look at how are we going to tell stories differently using your mobile. So the MDD has a challenge in that it, it's got to encourage news telling. And uh, I think, you know, for me, it's about education. There's got to be a huge emphasis on educational outreach. And maybe it starts with schools. I think a lot of journalists will tell you that they got into journalism because they used to read. So we need to learn to, or we need, as, as MDDA, it needs to be promoting reading, a reading culture. Reading leads to a desire to want to become like the person you see presenting the news on TV or, you know, someone on a TV news show. So the MDDA definitely has a great role to play, drawing on, on technology, drawing on you know, everyone talks about 4IR, but the real, the, the challenge is for MDDA even, is how do you make the 4IR touch someone in a, in, in a rural uh, town, uh, you know, area where the, the, the technology is slow. So yes, there is scope for digital in communities, but that's got to come with, you know, everyone talks about more spectrum 5G. When that happens, and obviously when it's cheaper, I think the MDDA can play a better role there. But at the moment, you know, we, we still have in, in communities, in rural communities particularly, there is opportunity for print to encourage that literacy, to encourage that reading, to encourage people to, to get into writing. So digital is the future, but we're evolving there. And maybe we, we can't rush, but we've got to have that as part of the planning. You know, MDDA has got to say, this is what's the future all about. And this is how you evolve into that. So you have digital magazines, you know, there, there's free platforms like ISU, I think, or ICE, IS, it's a funny way to pronounce it, but you, you get the sun, uh, one of the weekend papers on it and lots of magazines as well. So I hope I've answered your answer, your question there, honorable member. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, honorable, uh, honorable McKenzie, followed by honorable Fatu. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you, Mr. Nadu. I must say, I've uh, just sent a message on the on the uh, committee WhatsApp, but all the pictures are in perfect high definition, so I can see you all looking quite magnificent today. Um, Mr. Nadu, I particularly like the colour of your shirt. Um, <laughs> thank <laughs> you. You would as I wear my red tie. Honourable Mackenzie. Uh, that colour must yes. not distract you from uh, what. No, chairperson. It, it, it don't. I see behind Temping Corsi the big red curtains, so I feel comforted. I would just like to put it on record, chairperson, that I'm the only one wearing a tie to the interview. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Nadi, thanks very much for coming through, and it's, it's sure. quite a track record you have. Um, just a quote from your presentation, you were talking about media in terms of being free and independent. Mm -hmm. Now, given that the MDDA is financed um, by the fiscus and the fiscus is under control of the ruling party, um, when we did some oversight visits in the last term to some local community radio stations in Vembe, for example, in Limpopo, um, the community is is very tight knit, very closed, very essentially homogenous, um, and its its political and traditional leadership is well established and and well accepted. So so governance is solid in a community like that. 
Now, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So clearly, if my, my annual check is coming from the government, I'm going to be, as a radio station operator, going to be more inclined to give the local mayor or the local councillor some, some airtime, some free airtime to, to put his message forward. This is very important as we're coming into local government elections. And that's why your use of, of free and independent was, was, was quite important. As a, um, now, my party, uh, for, let's say my party is the EFF. If I need to go and campaign in the Bembe district, am I, how would you, as a director of the MDDA, communicate to your owners that that political neutrality is so important and how would you enforce it, especially coming up to elections?